If you think you've seen it all, think again. When Jordan Peterson first shot to the scene a few years ago, one interview with transgender studies professor Nicholas Matt was the most frustrating aversion to basic logic that I've ever seen, but I think if you chip through the ad homonyms and misrepresentations in this next clip, you can actually dig up one core question by Jordan Peterson in the entire discussion that no one can answer. Before I tell you what that is, watch this incredible exchange on gender pronouns that demonstrates just how far the gender debate has gone. I thought it was an axiom, say, of feminism, for example, that the personal was political. I mean, isn't that the... That's a famous well, phrase, the personal is political. Okay, the but personal speak, is political when someone is attacking you on a basis that is personal and that you can't change about yourself. That's a, that is political. And that's when people sometimes become politicized, is when they realize that no matter what they do in the world, there will be people who will continue to attack them on racist grounds, on gender and sexual violence grounds, and that's why people start to fight back, and that's why people object. And your, but attempts, on, and your attempts to regulate my language use and I don't care repeated. about your language use. I care about the safety of the people who are being harmed. I know. Pe people who make your kinds of arguments are always concerned with other people's safety. I'm concerned with my own safety. My, just so that people are aware, my physical, emotional, life and livelihood is at risk from being here. And that's not in true of everyone. In comparison to mine, say. I don't know about yours because yes, I don't you do. live your life. You know perfectly life. well about mine. I do you know, know that you have tenure and that that's one of the major ways that you're able to do this. Um, but I just want people to be aware that trans and gender, gender diverse communities and especially uh, people of color are being targeted and threatened physically. So free speech is a great idea and equality is a great idea, but we actually can't have those conversations when people are not even able to be present. I mean, basically, Jordan is arguing that this is going to create chaos and anarchy and that it's, that it's essentially a Marxist plot um, uh, that um, is there to sow violence and there to sow confusion. Um, and topple any kind of hierarchy. Can I just jump in there for a second? Is that an accurate characterization of your I view on really this? I listened really closely to that tape. Okay. I think it is. is it, in your view, has she accurately characterized where you're coming from? Um, there, it's not a transsexual cabal by any stretch of the imagination. Um, is it a cabal of radical left-wingers? Yes, it's a cabal of radical left-wingers, and they've been active behind and in front of the scenes in increasingly over the last 30 years. And my estimation is that departments like women's studies have trained between 300,000 and 3 million radical left-wing activists, and they're making... And they're all underpaid, so don't worry. <laughs> well, they could pick higher paying occupations <laughs> if they wanted higher paying occupations, but... Because sexism does not exist. <laughs> Are you kidding let's, me? Let's not get off topic here, but, folks. I think those two minutes exemplify the reason why Jordan Peterson calls on us to be precise in our speech in his book. You know why I say that? All you need to do is go back and play how many times Nicholas Matt used the word attack, violence, harm, and threat to simply refer to someone that opposes the mandating of preferred gender pronouns. I mean, to be honest, if you didn't have the relevant context for this discussion, I wouldn't even blame you for leaving the clip with the impression that Jordan Peterson was a bully picking on some trans students for no reason. Not for a moment do you see this gender studies professor contend with the core of the debate, which is the far left using the law to capture what people say or think. Here's the thing about words, they're not just containers of ideas, but almost act like levers that can be used to change the connotation of the idea they describe. Take for example the word gay, which for long is used to mean happy or ecstatic, but as the word almost became tied up in the gay rights movement, it shed its past meaning and took on a different one. None of that happened as a result of force and came about as a natural progression and evolution of language. I think that's the core question that Jordan Peterson is interested in when it comes to the gender pronoun debate, because people that think they can drive societal or verbal evolution by using the law to nudge it in the direction they want only end up taking away the right of people to speak their mind. In the world of language and linguistics, there's two very different schools of thought that I think can inform this debate. One is the prescriptivist school of thought, and the other is descriptivist. Simply put, the prescriptivist linguists believe that language should be static and have a correct version that is taught and reinforced. From grammar to vocabulary to pronouns, language is constructed first and people have to follow it afterwards. Then the descriptivists came along and gave a completely different view of language, 
They said that it is something in constant flux and evolution, its rules, grammar, and things like pronouns are always changing as the society itself changes. In other words, people use language first and we observe the rules and structures that naturally come about from inside language in a bottom-up manner. But notice that nowhere in history has it ever happened that language was shepherded along by a leader or his rulebook, except in maybe the most extreme authoritarian or communist societies. There was always largely an understanding that beneath the words and language was a reality being described that could not be changed so quickly. That's why I think if Nicholas Matt understood how easy it is to see through the obfuscation and mangling of words like attack or harm in the gender pronoun debate, he would realize that it's only counterproductive even to trans rights. When the suggestion is made that somehow if if we have words that don't fit into a, a something that we're very familiar with and that we've used to date, that chaos will ensue, that everyone well, will there's, be there's, confused. There's, there's the two, I don't believe that. There's the, no evidence of that historically. I, I, I hear you, but the, there was no law obliging people to use the word Actually, Miss. But there were laws to oblige, to oblige people to change um, uh, the way that we referred to uh, black people, for example. Um, you know, there was there was a time when there were any number of words that we now can only say as letters in polite company. And that evolved. Those things changed. When I was a teenager, people were still using those words. Um, so and this is a natural evolution in your this view? This is a natural evolution, and nobody's chaos will not ensue. If it's ensue. a natural and evolution, it, then we don't need hate speech law to enforce it. But, but we obviously we do, situation. because we can drive social change, and it doesn't all have to lead to chaos, is, is my point. And, and I think that you know we have seen the flip side of Jordan's argument, I think, has in fact, we do have a historical record of that. So when it was left to others to name people. We lost indigenous names. I come from, my mother's from Ireland. She was from a generation that finally got to learn her own language again. Mm. She couldn't even speak Gaelic to her parents because they hadn't been allowed to speak it. So we know we've seen the effect when people can't use their own language, when they can't use their own names. Okay, and, and let me get Jordan to respond to that. A natural evolution of things, Jordan. That's it, how it's look, being described. Words are tools. Um, maybe that was one of the great philosophical discoveries of the 20th century. and. And that means, and people are always looking for new tools to operate in the world. And if you invent a good tool, like a new word, then people will pick it up just as fast as they possibly can. You really see that in English. But the words that are being required now are not good tools, and that's why people aren't using them. And so instead what we have is the use of force, despite the fact that that's being denied. Um, although we've already established that, at least in the opinion of one of the people on this panel, I'm already guilty of a hate crime, which is what I said I was guilty of when I made that video. We're, Steve, the issue with the law is quite straightforward. The government is responding, is requiring us to use certain language. That's not the same as not using certain language. And it's a line, and this is the fundamental issue. This is maybe the fundamental issue. That's a line we should not cross. We should not allow the government to decide which words we're allowed to use. It's a mistake, and it's a mistake that strikes right at the heart of free speech. And the thing about free speech is that it's not the right to criticize your uh, leaders, which is what people usually characterize it as. Is freedom of speech is freedom to engage in the processes that we use to formulate the problems in our society, to generate solutions to them, and reach a consensus. It's actually a mechanism. It's not just another value. And you should put constraints on free speech with the most extreme caution because you interfere with people's ability to think and communicate. What more evidence would you need to prove that Jordan is coming at this debate with a good heart than the fact that he has repeatedly said he would use a trans person's preferred gender pronoun in a private setting to make sure they're comfortable? And yet all of that conveniently gets slipped under the rug for anyone that wants to make him out as a villain in the gender pronoun debate. It is the intellectual courage of not wanting to use them in a public setting that sets him apart, even though Jordan Peterson knows he may be wrong in some ultimate sense. And by the way, this level of courtesy is afforded by a lot of people today, even though they believe pronouns are ultimately attached to biological reality. Shouldn't that be good enough for someone like Nicholas Matt who can't seem to stop smearing people with the idea that they're attacking trans people by not using their preferred pronouns? 
I was surprised to know that it's not just Jordan Peterson who's willing to give this inch to the advocates of gender pronoun mandates, but also established biologists and evolutionary thinkers like Richard Dawkins, whose entire job and field of study is based fundamentally on the distinction between the male and female sex. I'm perfectly happy to um, address a trans person by their preferred name and prefers, preferred pronouns. I think it's just a matter of politeness, really. Um, what I object to is the um, insistence that I am a woman. I mean, you're not a woman. You're, you're, I'm perfectly prepared to call you she if you, if, if, you, if you like and call you whatever your preferred name is. But to say I am a woman is a debauching of language, and that's where I draw the line. And just as predicted in the case of Jordan Peterson, Dawkins also came straight in the line of fire of some trans activists, even to the point of having his Humanist of the Year award stripped of it. Maybe that's a small price to pay for being able to speak what you believe is the truth. I mean, I think that, that the real problem here is that there's a concerted attempt made, being made by many people to subvert all values to the value of equality of outcome. And we need more than one value, first of all, if we're going to survive as a society, because you can't solve every problem with the same approach. But there are more insidious things, in my estimation, going on underneath. I mean, even the, the, the uh, missive that you just read said that, well, even providing me with a platform, let's call it, to express my views, is something that shouldn't be allowed. It's like, yes, that's why I made the video. I, it was because many people are claiming that the expression of these sorts of views should no longer be permitted. And it's this view for now, but this is a minor issue in some ways compared to the larger issue that's at stake, which is there are right to have discussions of this sort at all. Like, I mean, one thing that happened right when we started this was that there was an initial claim, for example, that there's no such thing as biological sex. Well, I believe quite firmly that if we continue on our present path at the universities for five more years, that's a discussion we will not actually be able to have on campuses. Because, because it will be... I fear it. I mean, the legislation already implicitly presumes that that biological sex, gender identity, and gender expression, which we haven't even talked about yet, vary independently. That is simply not true. That was a prophecy that almost seems to be getting true as the years pass because an increasing number of teachers and professors feel the pressure to not say that they are only two sexes or genders. In 2022, we saw something similar when students at a university campus called on their professor to be fired over that opinion. When you look at this debate in full, the gender pronoun idea almost becomes an irrelevant sideshow that's not even that interesting. What's truly interesting is just how far the line of free speech is being pushed in the name of compassion, and whether governments will ever set the dangerous precedent of compelled speech. Because if they do, it would certainly point to a dystopian future that we are headed for, and that's exactly what people like Jordan Peterson have been warning us against.